So previously in a sermon, I was joking about how God might want to restore my hair. And he could choose several means to do so, right? He could just cause the hair to grow miraculously right here, right now. Would that be awesome? I'd get viral video for that. God could use a medical means to grow my hair, or he could ask me to do certain things, and as I did them, my hair would grow. But the point is that God gets to choose the means by which he brings the blessing. Now, I don't think the specific blessing of growing hair is mentioned in Scripture, is it? Has anybody seen that? No. There are several passages, though, about losing your hair. Do you know that? One of which, someone in my Pennsylvania church was kind enough to anonymously write in permanent marker on the wall of my garage. Sort of a more sustainable joke than that head-shaped chia pet I mentioned a couple weeks ago. But in any case, the same principle holds for biblically described blessings, okay? For example, God can heal us of physical problems. And sometimes he chooses to do this in a way that is obviously a miracle. The illness, even something as bad as cancer, just goes away. And we all sing God's praises. Other times in Scripture, we see just as much of a miracle. God takes away the problem after somebody has prayed for it. God can use medical science. He can strengthen our immune system. But God gets to choose the means by which he will bring the blessing. Another example, only God can bring people to saving faith. And so again, God gets to choose the means by which he will bring this blessing. Now in the New Testament, God always brings people to faith through a combination of the work of the Holy Spirit and somebody sharing gospel truth. That's the means God chose to bring that blessing. And the same principle is going to hold for spiritual growth, what we call progressive sanctification. Only God can renew a person's mind. Only God can transform somebody's character. It is a miracle, and only God can do it. So God gets to choose the means by which he will bring that blessing. Now, as we're going to see in our study, it takes a lot of grace, really, to take us from being a spiritual infant to a spiritual giant or a spiritual leader, okay? But there are also action steps God is going to ask us to take, and God will bless us through those activities. On the chart that we're going to see in the slides, the ovals are pure acts of grace. The rectangles are steps that God is going to ask us to take, and he's going to bless us through those actions, but also he's going to empower us to take those steps. Now, most of all this is going to come down to having faith enough to trust Jesus every step of the way. So we're going to talk about grace and faith or grace and trust as the keys to the sanctification process. But first, let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to worship you this morning. We have worshiped you in prayer and in music, musical praise, Hopefully, in our hearts, we have been trying to connect with you this morning, and we've been sensing your presence. Bless us now as we worship by studying your revelation in the Bible. We pray that you would speak to us from your scripture and from this sermon, that we would leave here today edified, enlightened, encouraged, just strengthened in our faith because we know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we are saved by grace, through faith, by the means of the blood of Christ. Consider 1 Peter 1.18. You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And we've been talking a lot about salvation and about the gospel as we've studied the book of John this year. What we call spiritual growth begins at the moment of salvation. Titus chapter 3. He saved us not by works of righteousness that we have done, but on the basis of his mercy, through the washing of the new birth 
and the renewing of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us in full measure through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are saved through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And in that initial salvation moment, we are washed in spiritual rebirth and we are renewed, spiritually renewed by the Holy Spirit. This awakens our spirit, our soul, to new possibilities of purity and goodness. We go from spiritual death to spiritual life. And thus we begin the spiritual growth process with a renewed nature that is ready to seek after God. Now most people when they come to faith and experience that rebirth, that renewing by the Holy Spirit, commit right then in their hearts to be seeking after Christ, to seek a more intimate relationship with God through Christ. And many even realize that there's going to be a need for change in their lives. And so they commit right then in their minds to change some of how they, they live, how they, what they do, what they say, how they think. We've discussed that much in previous sermons about God's vision for sanctification. So we are saved, we are washed, we are renewed by grace through the means of the blood of Christ. And then we continue to grow or develop spiritually because God continues to act in us by grace. Titus 2.14, Christ gave himself for us to set us free from every kind of lawlessness and to purify for himself a people who are truly his, who are eager to do good. By his sacrifice, Christ set us free from sin. And now it's Christ's work to purify us, to make us into his people experientially, just as we already are legally. To reiterate from a previous sermon, we are in salvation what's called positionally sanctified. That is, God has separated us out from the world and set us apart for himself and his good purposes. All of that happens when we come to faith. But now Jesus is going to progressively purify us so that we can learn to live for God, experientially be God's people following Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is God's will, that you become holy. Or as the NIV says it, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Once we start this process, we can be assured that God intends to complete he intends to develop us into the people that he originally designed us to be. As we learned before, God wants us to grow to be like Christ in character, healed in our emotions and spiritual issues, free from any bondages like addictions or depression, intimate with him, mature in faith and in understanding. The letter of 2 Peter begins, May grace and peace be lavished on you as you grow in the rich knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. I can pray this because his divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and godliness through the rich knowledge of the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. Through these things he has bestowed on us his precious and most magnificent promises so that by means of what was promised, you may become partakers of the divine nature after escaping the worldly corruption that is produced by evil desire. It is by God's power. It is a gift of grace that we have everything necessary for true life and godliness which comes through knowing Jesus Christ. We can become like Christ in character because of the salvation and because of the sanctifying grace which God gives us. And this is what makes Christian testimonies so compelling. I mean, countless believers all over the world can honestly testify that God has done a transformative miracle in them, that they have gone from addiction to freedom from bitterness to joyful love. 
from prideful arrogance to humility, and on and on and on. Even if you start out as a relatively good person, God is ready to do an amazing act of transformative miracle in you. Also, as part of our salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell us. Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, this person does not belong to him. All believers have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. Even those who are young in their faith or still a little wayward in their lifestyle, which we know because of what Paul wrote to the Corinthians who were young and wayward. 1 Corinthians 3.16, for example, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? And this is great because not only does it give us a sense of security about the preservation of our salvation, but as we'll see down the road, this also opens up a lot of opportunities for hope and for empowerment and growth. So all of this has been review for most of you. But in summary so far, the blood of Christ, our salvation, leads to two further blessings. The beginning of God's sanctifying grace, his work of grace in us to grow us, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. All of that is a gift, but now we need to make use of that gift. So we move to our first action step. We need to choose to follow Christ. Again in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? So Paul again assured the Corinthians that no matter how young in faith they might be, no matter how much they were still struggling with sin, they had the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. They were in essence now the temple of the Holy Spirit. But he also admonished them to realize that they are no longer their own. They no longer could pursue their sinful desires or follow the evil ways of their neighbors. Why not? Because in salvation, they were positionally sanctified, right? They were separated out from the world and set apart for God and his good purposes. So now... They had to learn to appreciate their new identity and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and thus learn to live for God. 1 John 2, 6, the one who says he resides in God ought himself to walk just as Jesus walked. Like the Corinthians, we need to learn to live for God. And another way of saying that is we need to learn to follow Christ. Jesus himself said in John 12, if anyone wants to serve me, he must follow me. And where I am, my servant will be too. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. If we want to be useful for God, if we want to be honored by God, then we need to follow Jesus. And the good news is that God is going to empower us to do this. That sanctifying grace that began in our salvation will make it possible for us to want, even, to follow Christ, to follow Christ's leadership in our lives. One of my favorite books in the Bible is Philippians. This is in chapter 2. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, continue working out your salvation with awe and reverence, for the one bringing forth in you both the desire and the effort for the sake of his good pleasure is God. So Paul told the Philippians they should work out their salvation. That is, they should learn to live for God like a saved person through this sanctification process. But he also explained that God would bring them the grace so that they would desire to grow and change. And God would empower them to make the effort to grow and change. Now let's talk about that desire for a moment. We need to desire the growth that Christ offers us. 
We need to desire renewal of our minds and transformation of our characters and the consequent change in our lifestyle. We need to desire to become God's image, to become like Christ. But what if we don't? I mean, sometimes we don't want what God wants. Sometimes we don't want to do what God wants us to do. In those situations, we have to pray to God and ask him to help us to desire what he wants and help us make the effort even if we don't desire what he wants. The founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, Lewis Spurry Chafer, wrote, we make no promise that we will not sin or violate the will of God when we yield to him. We do not promise to change our own desires. The exact human attitude has been expressed in the words, I am willing to be made willing to do his will. And you know, my wife has taught me this over the years. She might know what God wants her to do, but she doesn't want to do it. And so she will pray for God to help her want it. She says, I want to want to do God's will. Now, as God grows us in our desire to be like Jesus, we will start to trust Jesus as our example. We will trust his guidance, his vision, and his work in us, even his sovereignty in our lives. We will learn to trust and obey Christ in everything. This is our own declaration of sanctification, that for God we will be different, that for God we will be holy. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2. So if someone cleanses himself of such sinful behavior, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. But keep away from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace in company with others who call on the Lord from a pure heart. We choose to chase after Christ and his way of life, turning away from sin and from evil. As our first cooperative step in the sanctification process, we are choosing to trust that Jesus is our example and that God, through Jesus, wants to show us the best way for a human being to live. We are choosing to trust and obey Jesus, having faith in Christ not only to save us to eternal life, but to make us whole and guide us in this temporal life. And so there's the big question for today. Do you trust Jesus to make you whole and healthy? Do you trust him enough to let him guide you in every aspect of life? I hope so. If so, then because we trust Jesus, because we want to follow Jesus, we want to walk in his light, we're going to submit to his sovereignty in our lives. As we've seen in previous sermons, if we want to be intimate with Christ, walking in the light with Christ, then we need to submit to his will. We need to be willing to do whatever he wants us to do. If you want to memorize a passage of Scripture during this sermon series, this is a good one. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. So we have multiple related goals here. One is to submit to Christ, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. God asks us to be willing to sacrifice our desires, our will, our time, our energy and effort, basically our whole lives. We present ourselves as a sacrifice by submitting to Christ's leadership in our lives, by committing to follow him in all things. Goal number two is to resist the pressure to conform to our corrupted world, our culture. We all know the lure 
of worldly things is strong. And so we're going to have to be empowered by God to resist the temptations, the distractions, the deceptions, the fleshly attitudes of our culture. And the third goal is what makes these possible. We are to experience God's work in us, the transformation from this sanctification process through the renewing of our minds. Because only if God renews our minds and transforms our characters will we be able to discern God's will for us and discern what is right and good instead of wrong and bad. Only then will we be able to resist immersing ourselves in worldly things and instead choose to sacrifice for Him. Now, it's important for young believers to make a commitment to follow Christ in all things and thus begin submitting to Christ right away. We come to salvation by grace through faith, but true faith should lead us into wanting to follow Christ. Now, some new believers greatly commit and deeply submit to Christ right away, and this is really best for them because it gets them on to a great start of the spiritual growth process. For others, the level of submission builds over time as the Holy Spirit continues to do His work in them. Some people have a post-salvation crisis experience which shocks them into a deeper level of consecration or dedication to God. And I can tell you from my own experience, it's possible to have all three of these occur in your life at different times. Now, we don't like the word submit in our culture, do we? Personally, I like to think of following Christ rather than submitting to Christ. It just sounds better. But the problem is that we can think of ourselves as being Christ followers. I mean, I bet everybody in this room who believes in Jesus thinks, yeah, I'm a Christ follower. But we can think that easily, even though we're pretty terrible at submitting to Christ in some parts of our lives. I mean, just think of the example I gave you last week. Most of the time we think, okay, I know what I should do, and I know when I'm going to do it, and now I'm going to ask God to bless it. As opposed to, I'm going to actively seek to know God's will for me, what he wants me to do, when he wants me to do it, and then I'm going to do it even if I don't want to, even if it's a sacrifice. Those are very different perspectives, aren't they? And it's easy to slip into that I'm in charge, but I'll ask for the blessing mode of thinking. Whatever your present experience or your spiritual maturity level, the more you can submit to Christ today, the easier the growth process will be for you going forward. But some good news is that this is kind of a circular process that feeds on itself. God's grace has allowed us to choose a certain amount of submission, a certain willingness to follow Christ. But as we do that, we will grow spiritually. And so we will grow in our commitment to Christ and our willingness to follow and submit. And so then we'll grow more. You've heard of a sin cycle probably that takes you down into the pit. This is a growth cycle that lifts you back up. Another aspect of following Christ, of submitting to Christ's authority in our lives, is to, sub to accept God's sovereignty in our circumstances. We have to accept the challenges and limitations that we have in our lives and be willing to sacrifice and suffer for Christ. Again, in 1 Peter chapter 2, if you do good and suffer, and so you endure in faith, this finds favor with God, for to this you were called, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. Suggesting the need to sacrifice and even suffer, Jesus himself said in Matthew 16, if anyone wants to become my follower, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Most of us, when we have hardships, whine, right, in our prayers, oh God, please take this away. And there's nothing wrong with asking God to take away your hardships. 
but we should also be praying that God would glorify himself through our suffering. In submitting even to the point of suffering, we are following the example of Christ. And if we do suffer in submission, then we will grow to become more like Christ. James chapter 1. My brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy when you fall into all sorts of trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect effect, so that you will be perfect and complete, not deficient in anything. You know, a woman in the church told me that when she was struggling some in her life, when some, her circumstances were not to her liking, that she turned away from God. And I'm sure some of that was seeking coping in the world's ways, but a lot of it was just anger at God. Why did he put me in these circumstances? But while she was over here walking more in the world and away from God, God called her back. And she realized she didn't want to be over here. She wanted to be with God. And so she turned around and got back right with God and accepted the fact that God is sovereign in all things. He is sovereign in her circumstances, which aren't ideal for her. But this is living out this verse in James because she endured in her faith. And because of that, she is growing spiritually. Sometimes, struggle is the means God chooses to bring about our blessing of spiritual growth. Every believer is going to experience God's work in him or her to bring them deeper into submission. God is willing to get drastic to help you break free of your self-reliance and to help you stop being wayward and tolerant of the sin in your life. The means that God uses to sanctify us to the point of submission might even sometimes include chastening or suffering. He's trying to get us to turn back to him. God is way more interested in your spiritual health and your spiritual growth than he is in your happiness. And if you can come to terms with that, it'll go a long way toward helping you understand God and what he might be doing in your life. Hebrews chapter 12, my son, do not scorn the Lord's discipline or give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son he accepts. Endure your suffering as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? Now all discipline seems painful at the time, not joyful. But later, it produces the fruit of peace and righteousness for those trained by it. So if you can commit, if you can submit to Christ fully today, it'll obviously be better for you. But whether you're suffering or not in life right now, it pays to assess in what ways, in what aspects of your life are you maybe less than 100% obedient. And then commit to live more like Christ as he empowers you to do so. When I was a young Christian, I made the mistake of not committing to submit to Christ in all things. I mean, none of us can obey perfectly, but in some areas, I wasn't even trying. I mean, I don't understand it now, but I was committed to follow Christ in some things, but in others, I wanted to hold on to the world. One way I didn't commit was in the area of humility. I was proud I was arrogant. You know, I liked thinking I was God's man. I was a believer, and I liked thinking, hey, I'm God's ambassador here. But somehow I got a sense of entitlement about it. Like God was supposed to bless me because I was his ambassador, not that I was supposed to sacrifice for him. And I think that's the real reason I lost my hair. I really do. God took my hair. He took my rippled abs. And if you don't believe it, I have pictures. They were there. He took my career. He took my joy. He brought me to my knees in submission. Last year, 
when Chris was preaching, he preached on worship. And he said the Greek word most often used in the New Testament for worship, proskuneo, literally means to prostrate yourself in an attitude of devotion, dependence, and submission. That's true worship. And God desires that true worship from us, and he will do anything to bring us to be fully intimate with him, fully worshiping him, fully obeying him. He is not going to tolerate those little rebellions that we think are okay. Another way I didn't submit was with women. And I say this for you younger people in the church. It makes me sad to say that on our wedding night when Leanne could tell me that she had saved herself for me, I couldn't say the same thing. There's something special about saving that level of intimacy for your spouse. And because I wasn't willing to submit in this area of my life, I mean, I don't get it. Somehow I thought I could be God's ambassador and James Bond at the same time, but because I was over here in this area of my life, I opened up vulnerability to all kinds of demonic work. And this became bondage for me. I became a womanizer. And it was a very painful process that God took me through to set me free. Whatever you hold on to in the world is going to own you. If you are willing to give it up, God might not take it away, okay? Though you guys who have that truck, you're not willing to give up, you love your truck. I understand. I used to have a truck. God might not take it. But if you tell him he can't, that this is what you're holding on to, then it's an idol. And especially in behavioral things, they will own you. None of us can be perfect, but we can be committed to follow Christ. We can be submitted to Christ. We might slip up, but we're going to stop tolerating our cussing, our gossip, our white lies, our straying eyes, our breaking the law when we drive down Central Street in front of my house, which is right over there. I am watching you, and so is God. Seriously, you have a choice to make. Do you want to be God's person experientially? Do you want to be made healthy and whole do you want to reflect his character and represent him here? Or would you rather live like the unsaved, mired in sin, weak in faith, ineffectual in ministry, intimidated by life's challenges because you don't have the Holy Spirit's help because you're ignoring it? Today is your day to make that choice. I want you to make, even if you think you've made it before, that crisis experience, you don't want to go through that like I did. Choose today to commit 100% every aspect of your life to following Jesus. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to pray about that. Go ahead. All right. I'm sorry I'm a little ragged. My voice, my brain, long week. God provides us with spiritual growth, with transformation, with progressive sanctification, and it is an act of grace. But the means he chooses for providing this gift include asking us to take certain steps, to do certain things. And today we talked about some truths we need to believe, but we also learn that we need to submit to Christ as our leader, our master. He's our king. He's the head of the church. He's God, right? He's God the Son. 
So here's some homework for you this week. First of all, make sure you believe in the true gospel. Okay, just like in Jesus' day, there are a lot of false gospels out there in our culture today. You don't want to be believing in a fake Jesus, right? That would be idolatry. That's why John hammers home who Jesus is. Make sure you know who Jesus really is, why we worship him, why he was able to accomplish on the cross what he did. Make sure you believe in that, okay? Who he is, what he's done for you. Second, believe in the promise, the biblical promise, the vision of spiritual growth. God wants to do a miracle in you. He wants to heal you. He wants to develop you into the person that he designed you to be. If you missed one of the first two sermons in this series, I encourage you to go to the website. It's a YouTube link. Watch the videos. Or if you're a reader, email me and I'll send you the script. Okay? But you want to buy into this vision that God has for you. Third, believe that the Holy Spirit indwells you. This can be a great source of hope for you, and it will empower you to stay in the light with Christ. And then fourth, commit to following Jesus. Submit to Jesus in every area of your life all the time. Make that commitment, pray it, write it down, keep it somewhere, tell your friends, ask them to encourage you and hold you accountable. That's one of the best ways to stay walking in the light is to tell one of your friends, your good friends in the church, say, here's the area I struggle in. I give you permission. You see me going down that road, come smack me on the head. Hold me accountable. Because I'll tell you, once you know somebody's watching, you're a lot less likely to do it. And if you learn something in the Bible, put it to action right away. All right? Every day when you're reading scripture, try to learn something, some truth or some application step for yourself and put it to work. Let's pray. God, thank you for the work that you want to do in us, the work you are doing in us, the work you're going to complete in us. I love being in this church. I've I've been so excited the last two days to tell my friends about this church and all that you're doing here and how excited I'm going to be a year from now when we all look back and realize how much you have grown us this year. We're looking for renewal of our mind, Lord. We don't want these negative thoughts. We don't want these impulses to do the wrong thing. We don't want to be tempted anymore or deceived. We ask you, God, renew our minds transform our character so that we desire the things you desire and we want to walk in that light with Jesus. We want to see those miracles in ourselves and we want to see miracles happen in each other because we know what you do inside. That'll make results change in how we live. And the fellowship that we have here will be incredibly better as we learn to love the way you love, as we learn to be selfless the way you are selfless. And our worship will be passionate inside, even if we don't always show it the same way outside. And we will be out there sharing your truth because we just can't help it. We just want other people to experience what we're experiencing. So I'm looking forward to that, and I pray you will do these miracles in us, that you will bless us as a church, and that you will bless each person who's here right now, just that they will know you are with them, and they will be reassured and built up. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.